Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, tutorial on neural network verification. Uh, so uh, my name is Chou Xie. I'm an assistant professor in UCLA. Um, so to uh, so uh, today I'm going to give to neural network verification in the beginning, and then Huan, Kai Di, and Shi Qi will talk about the methodology and also how to use like our developed uh, neural neural verification package to solve your real problem in practice. Um, so to be so to begin, we already know neural network are very powerful uh, tool and can be applied to many real applications. Uh, when we apply neural network to some uh, mission critical task, like when when the like autonomous driving medical equipment or security uh, applications. It is important to know uh, whether the neural network will fail under uh, extreme scenarios. Uh, and this is very important because in those applications, the failure of neural network can lead to very severe outcomes. For example, in autonomous driving systems, we use neural network as object detector, and we also use neural network to control the self-driving cars. But if the object detector fails to detect a stop sign or any object on the road, then this could lead to very bad outcomes. And also, there are many applications of neural network in medical domains like AI-based diagnosis. Uh, in this case, you want to make sure the neural network will give the correct predictions. Um, otherwise, it will be uh, very hard to apply in real world problems. Uh, and finally, there are many other applications like surveillance systems. You want to make sure if there's any anonymous behaviors, the neural network can always detect that. So uh, in order to apply neural network to those mission critical systems, an uh, important thing before deploying neural network is to check, uh, check whether the network can behave like what we uh, expect. Uh, however, uh, it has been shown in many uh, recent papers in the past like five to six years that neural network can uh, have very uh, can have many failure cases in under extreme scenarios. Uh, for example, let's just take two uh, recent examples uh, from recent papers. On the left hand side, we have a recent ICCB paper. Um, so they are showing that if you if you uh, have a projector to change the illumination condition of the stop sign, then an object detector can misclassify this stop sign as a speed limit sign, which is uh, very bad for uh, autonomous driving systems. On the right hand side, we also have real um, non robust neural network, non robust neural networks in medical domains that we we can find. Neural networks are not robust to rotation of the images, or some. Um, if you if you have a text and you change it to some equi equivalent uh, sentence, the neural network will misclassify. So for all those examples, we found it is uh, very hard to trust the behavior of neural network unless we can formally verify uh, the predictions. So this leads to the following. The this motivate the area of neural network verification. So, in neural network verification, we hope to prove that neural network uh, have some desired behaviors like what we expect. So, usually in this area, we are we the users will try to give some specification, and the uh, our tool or our algorithm will try to provide a formal proof. To show that neural network behavior uh, have the desired properties, and one of the most commonly used property is the robustness property. So, if you have an image classification system like this one is a dog and cat classification system, uh, if you have an image which is correctly classified as dog, then we expect any image with small perturbation with uh, to this original image should also be correctly classified as dog. Um, so the 
the desired property here is the robustness property, where we want to prove that if you have an original image and if you add any uh, small perturbation within some uh, small epsilon LP norm both, the prediction will always be unchanged. Um, and today we are going to focus on this application, but there are many other applications for neural network refactoration. Uh, for example, in the if you want to ensure the fairness of the neural network models, you want to um, if you consider gender bias, then you want your system AI system to give the same prediction. Uh, if you no matter what kind of gender features you are giving uh, to the as input. And also, there are many cases where we want the neural network to have some monotonous uh, property. For example, if you want to, uh, if you want to develop a loan uh, approval system, then the loan should be a monotonic function, monotonic function to the income, and you want to verify your neural network have, have those kind of properties. Uh, also, there's a very important application in control system where we want to uh, make sure the control system is correct under different scenarios. And this is already a real world system where people try to use verification tool to verify the behavior of the next generation like uh, flight control systems. Finally, uh, there are also some recent applications in interpretability, because if you know the behavior of neural network, you can use them to um, to give some uh, uh, important level for each features in the text or in the images. So, um, so uh, after giving those applications, let's try to formally define what is, uh, how do we mathematically define neural network verification? So we, we are going to use this robustness verification as an example. So in, again, in robustness verification, we want to predict, we want to prove that if you have an image and add, if you add any uh, perturbation within some perturbation set, the prediction will remain unchanged. And this kind of robustness property has been very important. And previously, there are some many methods are using adversarial attack to, uh, to evaluate the robustness for machine learning systems. However, uh, the problem of adversarial attack is the attacks are not reliable. So if you can find a adversarial, uh, so if you can find a adversarial successful adversarial attack, that is good. But if you cannot, if your attack cannot return a good perturbation, it doesn't mean the system is safe. Uh, taking this uh, right hand side figure as an example, you have the original uh, image x zero. And you have a perturbation set. This is the uh, uh, the ball around the original image, and your neural network have a decision boundary here to classify dog versus cat. So in this case, your adversarial attack maybe uh, give you some uh, failure adversarial example which cannot change the um, cannot change the prediction. But there may still exist some optimal attack such that. Uh, uh, which will change the dog into cat, like the red point. So, uh, this uh, so the attacks are not reliable, and it's already uh, results in many uh, difficulties in studying the result robustness. For example, there are many papers that are proposing a robust method that is uh, robust to existing attack. But later on, many uh, if there are Many in many cases, there are stronger attack to break the existing systems. So, uh, the community has been aware of the using robustness verification algorithm to prove the safety or uh, robustness uh, property of the machine learning models. If you can use formal verification algorithm to prove there exists no perturbation to change the prediction, then we can guarantee the model is robust on this input image no matter what kind of perturbation you are given so no matter even if there are very strong attack proposed in the future they cannot break the system so to mathematically de define the uh, neural network verification problem let's try to give a very simple example 
uh, in this case, we consider binary classification and you have the input image X0. You have a two layer uh, neural network and then the, because it's binary classification, so the output neuron. In the output layer, you only have one neuron. Uh, so we use f of x to denote the output neuron. If f of x is positive, then the model will predict, will classify the image as a positive example. Otherwise, if the f of x is negative, then the model will say this is a negative example. So this is a very simple uh, canonical binary classification neural network. And um, so in uh, this, and, and in forward propagation, we try to propagate the input point. The X0 is an input uh, d-dimensional vector into a neural network, and we get a single uh, final output. So to, we can mathematically formulate the robustness property as this way. Uh, so we want to prove the property that for any x within a certain uh, perturbation set, f of x should always predict a positive value. So this, uh, this means if you have an original image x0 here, and we want to prove any point within this perturbation set, the square, the uh, green region, any point within this green region, the, pre the model prediction is always positive instead of negative. Because if the model prediction is so fx is always positive within the region, then we can make sure the model always predicts the positive class uh, within this region, and the model will be robust. So in order to provide this kind of guarantee for a region instead of a single point, what we want to do is we want to propagate, uh, intuitively, we want to propagate this whole region, the square region, through the neural network and get the output value. And because you have an input region, the output value will be uh, also an interval instead of a point. So a naive way to do this is you can try to enumerate all the points within this region, propagate it through the neural network and get a final f of x. And then you compute the lower bound and upper bound of the output. However, um, because the usual, because the, 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 the perturbation set have infinite number of points, so uh, you, can, you cannot do this in practice. So conceptually, we need a method to compute, given the set of the perturbation set C, we want to compute the upper bound and lower bound of the output neuron within this input region. And, uh, how do we do this? So this can be formulated as an optimization problem. Uh, again, C is our uh, perturbation set. So in the universal robustness literature, usually people define C to be the set, uh, 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 LP norm ball set with the norm less or equal to epsilon. So if the original point is x0, then C is the LP norm around this point. So we can formulate, uh, if we want to get a lower bound of the neural network prediction, then what we want to compute, compute is the minimal value of f of x, given x belong to the perturbation set C. So, uh, and we denote this value as f star. So if we can solve this optimization, this is a constraint optimization problem. If we can solve this constraint optimization problem, then we can compute the lower bound of f of x. And similarly, we can use a, a similar method to compute the upper bound here. Okay, so uh, once you, so assume we can solve this problem and we get the optimal value f star. Then f star will give us the formal proof of the robustness uh, of the machine learning model. So if uh, f star is a positive value, f star greater than zero, then we know the lower bound of the output neuron is a positive number. So we know no matter what point within this, uh, within this input set, the output is always a positive class. And in this case, you can say the system is provably robust 
on this image. And on the other hand, if F star is a negative value, then we know the label can be flipped uh, a certain point within the region. So the neural network is not robust on this input image. Okay, so if we can get the exact value F star of this constraint optimization problem, then we can give a formal robustness guarantee for machine learning model. Okay, so uh, before going to the detail how we how we are going to do this, let's uh, try to generalize this a little bit. So in we we give the binary classification uh, case in this example where you have only one output neuron. So you can just determine uh, the prediction, the robustness by the sign of f of x. But this can be easily generalized to multi-class classification problem. If you have multiple output neuron, each neuron corresponds to a particular category, like a cat, dog, and panda, then we can use the, if we know the upper bound and lower bound for each neuron, then we can say something, we can prove the robustness properly. Like if you see the lower bound of cat is always larger than the upper bound of the dog, then the, the, the network will, and, and also larger than the upper bound of panda, then you can say, formally prove the neural network are always output cat instead of dog and panda. And in practice, you can use the, uh, you can use a linear, you can use like a cat neuron minus dog neuron and verify the, the sign of this neuron. And this can be generalized to any multi-class uh, classification problem. Okay, so let's go back to the single binary classification problem where we want to prove whether F star is positive or negative. So how can we, uh, we want to study whether solving this minimization problem is difficult. And unfortunately, this is a very hard problem if you want to get an exact uh, minimizer of this problem. So we can, for a given neural network, we can try to write down explicitly what is this optimization problem we're solving. So in this example, we have the neural network on the bottom of this slide. You have a X going through a linear layer, you get a Z1. And then you go to the redo activation, you get a Z, Z hat one. And then you have another linear layer, you get Z2. You have another redo, you get Z hat two. And then another linear layer, you get the final output. So in this neural network, um, we can, we can write down this neural network as the as those constraints in the optimization problem. So in the input layer, you have x equal to z, z, z hat zero, which is the just the input. And you know x belong to c, the perturbation set. And you propagate this x through the linear layer. So z i minus, for any z, my, i minus one hat, which is the, um, for any z, i minus one hat, you propagate through a linear layer. So multiply with w and add the bias term b, you get a z i, uh, which is the pre-activation uh, values of a neuron. And then you apply a nonlinear activation sigma onto LMOS to this z i, and you get the post-activation neuron. And then you propagate this again to a linear layer and the nonlinear activation until you get the final output. So the final output is z l which is the neuron at the final layer. And in this case, because we want to know the minimal value of f of x, so this is equivalent to the minimal value of z l here. So the, given the neural network like this, we can, and, and, and in general, given any feedforward network, we can write down the optimization problem as this constraint optimization form. And in this form, we can try to see why this is a difficult problem. So in the first, uh, in the first equality, this is a linear constraint, so it's very easy to handle using linear programming systems. In the final constraint, this is uh, 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 x equal to z zero is just a uh, linear constraint, and x belong to c because c is usually a simple like L infinity norm ball, so we can usually write down this as also as a linear constraint. But the difficulty of this problem is the second equality, where uh, because sigma is a 
nonlinear activation function. This will give you a nonlinear and non-convex constraint. Uh, taking the ReLU function as an example, you want zi the pre-activation function. The, uh, you want zi and zi hat i the pre-activation and post-activation to follow this ReLU graph. And this is not a convex constraint because if you take two points and you, uh, this is a constraint set, but it's not convex because if you take any two points here and you you link a straight line, then any any points with between those two points are not in the uh, constraint set. So this is a non-convex constraint, and this makes the whole uh, problem non-convex. And usually, solving a non-convex problem is very hard. And in 2017, actually, there's a paper proving. If you have a ReLU feed forward network, then solving this neural network verification problem is MP complete. So we don't expect a polynomial time algorithm for doing this. So, um, so in order, so how to solve the verification problem? There becomes two types of uh, approach. The first approach is to formulate this problem. Uh, into integer programming and using existing integer programming solver to solve it. So to formulate into integer programming, the main idea is to split the ReLU into two cases. The first case is a negative part. The second case is a positive part. And then you can formulate this as an integer programming problem, and then you use existing solver to solve it. And this also motivates some other recent approach using branch and bound uh, to split the ReLU neurons, which we will talk about this in the later on in the tutorial. And this is called a complete verification because even though this is MP complete, but we still try to develop some efficient algorithm to compute the exact solution of it. Uh, there's another kind of prob uh, algorithm called incomplete verification. So we try to avoid computing the exact value of the solution, but we try to find the lower bound of it. So in this case, if we want to find the uh, lower bound of f star, so if we found the lower bound of f star is a positive number, then we can see this, this, this also imply that f star is also positive. So this will give you a provably robust guarantee. If the incomplete algorithm output a lower bound of f star, but the lower bound is negative, then this doesn't imply f star is either doesn't imply that F star is positive or negative. So in the, the second case, you don't know whether you have the robust guarantee. So in complete verification, try to find a user efficient method to find lower bound of F star, but sometimes it cannot give you formally prove the property. And we will also talk about incomplete verification solvers in the talk. So finally, I'll give a brief history of neural network verification. So in the beginning, uh, several papers in 2017 start to study this uh, uh, verification problem. And as we mentioned, this is MP hard. So many people try to use existing solvers or some exponential time algorithm to, to compute it. And in the beginning, people can only do it for less than 100 neurons, so very small neural networks. And after several years of progress, now we can do complete verification with more than 100,000 neurons and on um, like uh, some standard CIFAR-10 uh, convolutional neural networks. So during this uh, time, there are several several important uh, types of algorithm proposed. The first type of algorithm is incomplete verification proposed in 2018 to 19, where people use a bound propagation algorithm to complete the incomplete bound, which uh, will be a main focus today. And the second, main step is to combine this kind of incomplete verifier with the branch and bound approach to get a complete verification and which we will also talk about it today so finally this is a chart for the existing solver so you can see in uh, the horizontal axis is tightness the vertical axis is the time cost so for complete verification you can get the tightest bound but people are trying to keep improving the performance and in incomplete verification, people are trying to make it uh, improve the tightness and efficiency of the uh, verifiers. Okay, so in the second part, we
will talk about the basic verification algorithm. So he will introduce several uh, state of the art in complete and complete verification algorithms uh, um, in the second part. Okay. So be before I uh, start, so anyone have, have any questions uh, regarding uh, the background and the introduction uh, of the neural network verification problem? So if you have questions, you can uh, go to the two spots uh, in this room where it says stand here for microphone. Um, you can go there and uh, uh, people can line up there and ask questions. Um, yeah, if there are no questions, yeah, uh, let's thank Cho for his excellent introduction for to, to the neural network verification problem. Um, yeah, thank and, you. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. So, can you see my screen? Yeah. Cool. And can you hear my sound clearly? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for attending this uh, tutorial. And uh, I'm Juan from Carnegie Mellon University. And I will be talking about the algorithm parts of this tutorial. Uh, and if you want to find the slides and the coding demos, uh, you can just go to our website, uh, neuronetworkverification.com. This should be easy to memorize. Uh, so, um, so Chu has just actually uh, talked about the introduction and uh, also mentioned there are many algorithms um, for neural network verification. But because uh, today's tutorial is pretty short, so we will just focus on a few representative and uh, state of art algorithms uh, in verification. So, particularly, we will talk about the bound propagation method, which actually uh, gives you a rather loose bound, but it's actually pretty fast. And also, the optimized bound propagation method, like alpha chrome, where you can get tighter bound by doing some optimization, but also becomes slightly slower. And also, uh, alpha beta chrome, which is uh, 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 the verifier developed by us, and uh, which was also the winner of last year's ver verification of neural network computation. So that's kind of the state-of-art state algorithm you you can use for neural network verification. So, uh, so today's focus will be on bound propagation methods and also uh, how to optimize this bound propagation method to get tether bound, and also the uh, complete for because bound propagation is the incomplete verifier, we also talk about how to change it to a complete verifier by doing branch and bound, which is um, which finally uh, um, uh, is our alpha beta quantum verifier, which is the winner of the win count 2021. Um, so a quick recap here. So to just uh, uh, introduce a binary classification setting where we just want to prove that if this function is positive, given uh, input precision set C. So this is just a basic formulation that we want to solve uh, using a neural network verification tools. And Cho has just introduced, we can formulate this problem, for example, as a uh, neat problem, and you can solve an integer linear pro problem. That, that's, that's pretty hard, right? And here we, uh, we want to minimize, find the minimum of this function to C. For example, if this minimum is still greater than zero, then we know the function will never I'll put anything else than cat for um, any input perturbation within this set C. So, uh, and the optimization problem we want to solve is just minimize this function within this perturbation set C. That's basically the simplest form of verification problem you can think of. So, and if you can, the minimum is less than zero, you know it's not robust, and if it's greater than zero, it's probably robust. Uh, so in all all of the uh, all the rest of the talk, we are focused on the robustness verification pro problem. But please keep in mind that uh, verification can also be used in and many other settings. As long as you can formulate some certain uh, specifications, so you, you eventually will minimize uh, a certain function um, uh, and see, see if it's greater than zero or minus than zero. This F can be a general criterion rather than just a class. So uh, today I will first talk about the bound propagation uh, algorithm called Quam, where actually you have uh, you can linearize the neural network function efficiently and find the lower bound of it. So uh, uh, as high level idea, um, Quam is the incomplete verification algorithm where you try to find the lower bound of neural network function 
giving a prohibition that is B. And if this lower bound is greater than zero, you can verify the natural history bus. And uh, Cron is a so-called bound propagation method, which helps you to linearize the neural network and find the linear lower bound uh, of, of, of the neural network function. The neural network function itself can be a quite uh, non-linear and non-convex function, but the, uh, the trick we use here is to linearize everything and get a valid linear lower bound. It is also equivalent to another popular al algorithm called deep poly, uh, developed by uh, colleagues uh, at uh, uh, ETH, uh, and uh, the two algorithms are actually uh, equivalent, but we're just uh, proposing them almost at the same, same time. Uh, so uh, let's assume that if our net neural network has no rival functions, then we can actually, uh, if we delete all the rival functions, actually the neural network can be uh, entirely written as a linear function. In that case, actually the verification problem is easy because you can actually merge all the weights layers of the network together to a single weight vector. And if you just want to take a lower bound of this single, simple linear function, actually you can, there are a closed form solution to solve the global lower bound of this uh, optimization problem. You can just take the one norm of A based on, and also based on the perturbation, uh, perturbation norm uh, of X, you can just uh, multiply that by epsilon and plus some constant and you get the uh, F star, which is the minimum value of this classifier output within the perturbation set. Uh, the trick we use here is actually to uh, convert a, a, a non-linear non function such as ReLU somehow to, to linear function so we can still handle them. So if we take a look at the ReLU function, actually, uh, we can find that there are two cases the ReLU neuron are already linear. For example, if we know the input of the ReLU neuron, it's always positive. In that case, uh, the ReLU will always be uh, always acting be acting like a linear function. So in this case, you you know the ReLU is a linear function. And if the ReLU function, the input of the ReLU function is always less than zero, um, and we, in this case we, we can just delete that neuron because the output of the ReLU is always zero. So here L and U are so called pre-activation bounds, also intermediate layer bounds, where uh, we assume if you already know these bounds, you can classify the rebel neurons into three classes, uh, uh, active, always active case, always inactive case, and the unstable case. The unstable case is where things get tricky, like Cho just introduced. You, you actually have a non-convex constraint in the optimization problem, and here we must relax this non-convex constraint. So the relaxation we're using the Crown algorithm is to use linear relaxation to basically find a linear upper bound and a linear lower bound to linearize this ReLU function. So although the ReLU function itself is not non-linear, but we can actually use two linear functions to bound upper and lower bound this ReLU function. And we can actually propagate these bounds uh, uh, across the network. That's basically the whole idea of the Cron algorithm. You replace the ReLU with linear bounds and also obtain a linear bound for the entire network. And this can also be attended to a non-ReLU function such as uh, hyperplanar max pooling. As long as you can bound the function using some linear lower hyperplane and linear upper hyperplane. So I will basically quickly show you how the bound propagation works. Um, and so suppose we have a three-layer neural network here, and Z here is basically the pre-activation value features, uh, and Z hat is the uh, post-activation features. And here W1, W2, W3 are just the weights of the neural network here. Uh, because we are assuming a binary classification setting, so the output, uh, the output layer only have one single neuron, so W3 is actually just a vector rather than tensor. And the goal is to get a lower bound of x of fx, given that x is in the perturbation set C. And the whole whole high level idea in Cron algorithm is to prom, is to propagate a linear lower bound for output neuron uh, through the entire network until you reach the input neuron. So how, how we do that? So as uh, the final output layer, so we have fx equals to this three. This is just by definition, and this can also be seen as a linear inequality because uh, this is the equality and this is a linear relationship from x to this three. This is just a special case of a linear inequality. And by definition, we know these three equals to w three transpose c two. They have two. So uh, by definition, if we just plug in the definition of these three here, 
we also get the linear inequality. Here is the special case is actually equality uh, for fx with respect to z hat 2. And the tricks comes from the red layer. Where because rebel is a nonlinear function, so you can cannot just plug in the the relationship between z hat two and z two. We have to replace rebel with a linear diagonal matrix D. This linear diagonal matrix D is specially designed such that this inequality still holds. Then and that's all the tricks come into play. Uh, so how to design this linear matrix D, such as the lower bound and the upper bound of the bound propagation are maintained. Uh, here I maintain the bounds. I mean, we always want to find the lower bound of x, fx during when we are propagating these bounds through the entire network. So, uh, first step is to um, linearize the right neuron by finding a linear lower bound and linear upper bound. So, the linear lower and upper, upper bound basically are just uh, uh, two linear equations with some coefficients a and b. I don't write the explicit form here. But they're just the two linear lines. You can you can derive the equations yourself. It's pretty easy. Uh, and the next the next step is to get the lower bound of this function f(x) equals to w3 transpose ReLU d2. And in that case, we can actually decompose this function because this is a dot product. We can actually lower bound each term uh, separately. And to to lower bound each each term separately. Uh, so when this weight w w three g the g element of w three is positive, we just take the lower bound of the red function. Otherwise, we'll take the upper bound of the red function. So you can you can uh lower you can lower bound this uh dot product by taking either the lower bound of the red function or the other or the upper bound of the red function, uh based on the weights based on the sign of the weight w three. So because this lower and upper bounds are all linear bounds, so this, uh, these two are linear bounds, uh, you combine the linear bounds by some weights, so there's still it's, you still get a linear bound. And if you just rearrange all the terms, you, you get uh, this, this, this like uh, critical um, inequality we have here. This is how we propagate the, uh, the, the linear inequality through the gradual layer. Then that's probably the most difficult part in the algorithm I present today. And after you get that linear uh, matrix D, and uh, uh, you, you, you now we have the linear uh, inequality from fx with respect to z2. And um, uh, we went we, we to, to find this uh, matrix D, we use linear relaxation of relevant neurons, as I demonstrated in uh, previous slides. So, and uh, to continue, uh, we have uh, another layer, another fully connected layer. We just uh, plug in the definition. Uh, Z two equals to W two Z hat one, and do the same for the next red neuron. Uh, do the relaxation, and you have a uh, diagonal matrix D, and do the same for the the previous uh, the the last uh, linear layer, and eventually we'll get the uh, uh, linear relationship from F X with respect to input X. Here, if you just uh, see everything be before x as a huge vector, because this is basically just a, a bunch of matrix multiplied together, you can you can just uh, merge all the matrix together as a single vector, uh, denoted as a cron here. So this is just a vector um, reflecting the linear uh, relationship between x and fx, and this. Tells you basically, uh, you can you can lower bound the function f(x) within the perturbation set C by the linear function, and all of this can be computed on GPUs because it's just a bunch of matrix multiplications. So uh, after you get the linear bound, things becomes easy because originally you must solve a non-convex optimization problem within the perturbation set C, but here you just need to solve a convex the linear optimization problem within the perturbation set C. And the lower bound, for example, uh, with respect to this linear function, it's just uh, this uh, in one of these endpoints. For example, it's just the f star cron denote here. And this, this value, f star, uh, f cron star, we, is actually a lower bound of this uh, fx function within the perturbation set C. So this lower bound only holds for within the set C. It doesn't have to hold outside of the set C because we only care about the property of the function within this perturbation set.
And uh, as ha uh, to summarize, we, we backward propagate the linear bounds through the network to get the linear lower bound function uh, for fx with re respect to input x. And to solve this linear function, is, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, and you can get the minimum of this linear function. And if that minimum is greater than 0, then we can successfully verify the robustness of the network. So we can also extend this to any arbitrary computational graph, actually. Uh, so I demonstrated the, the thing on a uh, fully connected network uh, three layer, which is pretty simple, but you can actually propagate this linear relationship. Uh, this linear inequality is from the output to uh, a arbitrarily complex uh, computational graph representing a neural network. The input of the computational graph can be the weights or also can be the, the input image. You can actually propagate this linear inequality to all the input of the computational graph to get the linear inequalities for output with respect to uh, either the input image or the weights. So when you propagate the, the bounds to the weights, so actually you can uh, calculate the weight per the output change on the weight perturbation. Like if we if I change the weight a little bit, what's the behavior of the output? And if you propagate the bounds with respect to input, you, you know the uh, the cell robustness property. You 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 know how the bound function behave uh, under input perturbations. Uh, so that's all the part for the bound propagation and how it works and how it can be attended to general computational graph. So the second part of my talk is going to be ex extend uh, the bound propagation method by making it tighter. And making it tighter here I means that actually you want to get a tighter lower bound so to achieve a stronger verification. Because the uh, tighter lower bound is you're, you're, you're closer to the complete verification and you, you can verify uh, more problem. Um, so uh, to, to tighten the bound, let, let's quickly recall that when we actually linearize the ReLU function, we have a low upper bound and lower bound. Here, our focus is just the lower bound. The lower, when you select the lower bound of the ReLU function, you will see that actually we have multiple options. So for example, we can either take this blue line here or this green line here. So both are actually valid lower bound. So actually, you can choose any lower bound uh, that's crossing the origin as long as its slope is between 0 and 1. And uh, uh, if you do that, actually, um, uh, we can actually try different lower bounds and try to find which lower bound produce the tightest bound. So that's the whole idea of tightening this bound using optimization. So at high level, uh, the Chrome linear lower bound can be seen as a function of alpha. Here, alpha is basically the, the slope of the uh, lower bound for an unstable rival neuron. And actually, each unstable neuron has a lower bound to select. So if we have uh, many unstable neurons in a neural network, actually, we have a lot of freedom here because with each unstable neuron, we have a lower bound to choose. And uh, after that, we can see actually the, the, the chrome bound as a function of alpha. And uh, we can actually use just using gradient ascent to choose the optimal alpha such that the bound is the tightest one. So because we implement everything using PyTorch, so the, the, uh, the values alpha, which is the lower bound of the uh, rel relaxation, is just a part of the computation. So we can just uh, uh, take gradients with respect to alpha, and we, we, can, we can just run a gradient ascent to get the largest possible lower bound because we are we are we are computing lower bound and lower bound is valid for any setting of alpha so we can actually automate alpha to find the optimal uh, lower possible lower bound so for example if lower bound is zero uh, if alpha is zero we get this lower bound and if alpha equals to 0 0.5 to a particular neuron the the lower bound can improve to be uh, closer to the function fx. So actually, you get a tighter lower bound. This is the whole idea of optimizing these bounds um, to achieve a tighter uh, verification. So to summarize, we can uh, optimize the lower bound of this uh, unstable rival function. Uh, and uh, when you optimize, the, lower, uh, optimize the, the linear lower bound, you can actually make the uh, bound tighter. And this, uh, we, empirically, we found that this can actually be even tighter than a more expensive linear programming based verifier. The, the reason here is because 
when we are using our uh, when we are offsetting this lower bound. Another factor is we have this intermediate layer bounds L and U, which also determines uh, the relaxation. And this L and U are actually computed recursively using Cron. And so when they are computed, they, they, their value can also be optimized by uh, choosing a better alpha parameters. So essentially, you're not just optimizing the lower bound for a single uh, random round. You're also making the pre-activation bounds L and U tighter. So that actually produce, uh, allows us to produce, produce an even tighter result than more extensive linear programming based variables. For example, if uh, uh, we have a figure here it shows that if you start uh, if you start uh, uh, to compute the bound without optimization when the iteration is zero, actually we get a worse lower bound than LP very far. But after we run the optimization for a few steps and the optimization can be done on GPUs, actually we, our lower bound quickly uh, becomes better than than the solution of a typical linear programming based very far. And uh, you, you don't have to run too many iterations, maybe just uh, 20 to 50 ish to get a pretty good uh, convergence. And you can you can use this fast lower bound as a for the verification problem. You can see here it's actually much better than an LP based verifier. And we also don't rely on an expensive solver to do the optimization. We just need to do the optimization on GPUs pretty quickly. And the last part of this presentation is when we talk about uh, beta quorum, which is an uh, improved bound propagation algorithm uh, with branch and bound so that we have a power of complete verification. So um, as Cho introduced uh, earlier in this tutorial, uh, when we are uh, solving this uh, robustness verification problem, uh, we can find the lower bound of this F star, for example, using quorum, but this is usually too weak. And, and uh, you cannot verify many practical models because the lower bound is too negative. For example, uh, lower bound is minus three, but the actual F star is, for example, one. Uh, then the, 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 the neural network is actually robust, but you cannot verify because lower bound is less than zero. And if for in a complete verifier, actually the aim is to find the true value F star. Uh, but here, the, the important part is we can improve this lower bound from minus three, for example, uh, iteratively uh, to make it converge to F star uh, using some using more time. So if we do have more time, we can just run a iterative uh, algorithm, for them to improve this lower bound to move it slower, so, so slowly to, to the true uh, minimum F star. And this lower bound, if this lower bound becomes positive, then we can prove the neural network is robust. So let's recall that for there are three cases for random neuron, and in two cases, in two of the three cases, the random neuron is already linear, and we don't need to do any relaxation. And for the unstable random case, it must be relaxed. Here we use linear relaxation during bound propagation, and this relaxation makes the bounds loose because you have so many unstable neurons in that neural network, and for each one you have to do some relaxation. And the overall impact is you get a quite loose lower bound for the verification problem. So how to deal with that uh, using branch and bound? So in branch and bound, there are two steps. The first step is called branching, where we split this, each unstable neuron into two subproblems. For example, this is a unstable rival neuron where we have to use the relaxations. But if we split this problem into two subproblems, where the first problem in the first subproblem, this rival neuron is active. And in the second subproblem, the relevant neuron is inactive. Then we can actually see that in each of these subproblems, um, the problem is linear, and we don't need any relaxation anymore. And uh, to, to, to split this neuron to two cases, we actually just need to add a simple constraint, like z1 greater than 0 or z1 less than 0. This is called split constraint to our optimization problem. This additional constraint actually makes our bounds tighter because it actually makes an unstable rival becomes a stable rival. So uh, we how, the second step of the branch and bound is the bounding step. In the bounding step, we can use a complete verifier, uh, incomplete verifier. For example, using an LP verifier, we can also use a cron as well to get a lower bound for each subproblem. For example, originally the lower bound using an incomplete verifier is minus three. And the goal is to prove F star is greater than zero. It's not going to prove that because lower bound is less than zero. 
Um, and after the speed, the, this unsupervisable neuron for two cases. For the first, two, for the first case, this neuron becomes uh, stable, and you don't have to do relaxation. And if you run an incomplete verifier on this no sub problem, you can get any two lower bound because uh, you have less relaxation here. And for the second case, um, the neuron is always inactive. And you can also get an improved lower bound. For example, it from it becomes minus uh, from from minus three to zero point five here. Um, and in this case, you can actually show that this subproblem is verified because this lower bound is already pro, uh, positive. But in this case, the lower bound is still negative. So how to further improve it? You you can split the next unstable rival neuron to further improve this bound until uh, it becomes greater than zero. So in branching bound, actually, you build a search tree uh, where in each level of the tree, we split a unstable rival neuron. For example, we start with the uh, initial solution of minus 3. And at the first layer, we basically uh, split this rival neuron Z1 to greater than 0 or less than 0 cases. And in each of the case, the bounds improve. And the new, new bound improves from uh, minus 3 to the worst case of the two, uh, of minus two and 0 0.5, so, so that's minus two. So you are, you are improving the lower bound from minus three to minus two. And we, we don't need to further split any uh, node on this graph that are already positive because it's already verified. And for this node on this uh, search tree, we further split another unstable neuron. And after you split, the bound can further improve from 0 0.2 to, uh, to minus 2 to minus 1 and minus 0 0.5. So in, in, in both of the cases, they are negative, so we need to do a further split. And uh, after the split further, you will see that eventually we can reach the point that either, um, we, uh, all, either uh, it is uh, greater than 0, so it, it can be verified, or if it's less than 0, you continue the split until all the subproblems problems are verified. So you continue, you just continue this process, um, and during this branch and bound process, the bound it keeps improving, and you can always get a better bound. And uh, uh, you, you eventually actually, you can by doing branch and bound, eventually you can reach the same object value f star as complete verification. So this is achieved by doing branch and bound. You can imagine that uh, eventually, uh, if I for example, if our network only have four neurons, uh, four unstable neurons, eventually we will split all the possible cases for each neuron. And in that case, we actually consider all the possible um, uh, cases for this, this rival network, and we can actually achieve complete verification. And the whole idea of our verification algorithm is to combine the very fast bound propagation algorithm, such as Huang I introduced earlier, on GPUs, with branch and bound to achieve very fast and very efficient complete verifier. In, in this entire process, you don't have to use any expensive solver, such as a uh, mixed integer programming solver or linear programming solver. And all these uh, bounds for this um, uh, search, uh, all these bounds on these nodes on the branch and bound search tree can actually be computed in a parallel manner on GPUs. You can, you can compute all the bounds all together uh, as a big batch on GPUs, so actually the cost for computing each bound actually becomes quite low. So, but one additional um, problem we need to deal with during bound propagation is this so-called split constraint. This only happens when you are doing branch and bound because you have to split the neuron either into the positive case or the negative case. And uh, during bound propagation, I showed you earlier, uh, we cannot handle such split constraint. And the beta cron is a new algorithm um, that can actually handle this split constraint during the bound propagation. So to handle the split constraint, we just actually add a Lagrangian multiplier beta here, uh, which says that this, this, uh, this term needs to be less than zero. For example, by defining a diagonal matrix S here, it contains either minus one or, or positive one values or zero based on the split constraint. Uh, and we, the trick here also is you can actually propagate this Lagrangian multiplier through all the layers. Because if you rearrange the term, you can see that we just need to modify uh, the linear uh, correlation 
uh, matrix sub three transpose C a little bit by adding a multiplier uh, multiplier data, and we can propagate the, this entire term just the same way as uh, in Chrome you you propagate the double three D two term. So everything can still be do in a similar way as in Chrome. You just when you, just when you propagate all the terms, you have an extra term on beta, and all the bound propagation procedure can still work uh, to handle this weak constraint. So eventually, after you propagate the bounds to the input layer, you got the beta Chrome bounds where uh, you consider all the possible subic constraints with optimizable parameter beta. Just like we, what we have done in alpha Chrome, here we also have an additional optimization from parameter beta where you can also optimize to make the bound tighter. For example, if beta is zero, you get this, this uh, looser lower bound, but if you choose a better beta, such as beta equals to one, then you get a tighter uh, lower bound. And all the process can also be done on GPU by doing gradient ascent, because we are just using an automatic differentiation framework such as PyTorch to get a gradient of beta and optimize beta. And the, <coughs> the entire procedure can also be combined with alpha quantum algorithm I introduced earlier, where you also have a alpha parameter to optimize. So you can optimize both alpha and beta parameters to make your lower bound as, as tight as possible. So, so this is the whole optimization algorithm uh, we all use actually in our state-of-art uh, verifier alpha beta quantum, uh, uh, which um, my colleagues will introduce er, uh, later in this uh, presentation. So, uh, so before I hand over my uh, to, to my colleagues for the next part, uh, so are there any questions regarding the algorithm for neural net for verification? Um, I will be very happy to answer your questions. So, if you have any questions, um, you, you just uh, go to the two spots in this room that saying that stand here for mic. You just go to that spot and you can ask questions. Um, yeah, so otherwise I can't cannot hear you. So cool. Uh, someone is there. So uh, Yishai, uh, so are you going to ask a question? Yes, thank you. So um, if I understood correctly, um, the, the input to this uh, uh, the problem is one picture, and uh, what you're doing is proving the robustness of uh, of the neural network with respect to one picture. For example, a picture of a cat, and uh, you know that right, if you perturb right. it a little. But then, ideally, what you would like to do is uh, prove robustness with respect to all cat pictures. So how would you do that? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, typically what people do that is just like uh, in, in the regular setting where, so, so for, for example, if I train a neural network, how, how can I show that uh, my neural network always classified correctly for cat pictures? So the way of testing that is just a construct a test set where you, you try the neural network on every possible cat image, and maybe not every possible, but for every image in the test set and you, you compute the clean accuracy or whatever for, for, for that uh, classifier. And in our setting, we can also do the same. For example, you, you, you use the same test set of, ta of cat images because we cannot actually enumerate all the possible cat images. That's kind of impossible here. You, you still need to construct a test set. And on the test set of images, then for each one, you can verify if it is robust. Just like uh, when you, you verify the problem, when you test the network if it is a uh, uh, prediction correct, pre predicting correctly or not. So just for each image, you, you, just, uh, you just verify and see if you can verify it successfully. So you get a so-called verified accuracy instead of just a standard accuracy uh, after you run the verifier. But I know there is a different problem where uh, we do want to show some, in some cases, we want to show some global properties of the neural network, such as, uh, as you mentioned, we want to show that all for all possible cat images, the customer also always produce the correct answer. That's actually a pretty difficult question because uh, for, because technically you cannot easily to enumerate all the possible cat images. And there is some, always some images that's kind of kind of on, on or very close to the decision boundary where you cannot really show it is robust. For example, there's, if there is a cat image that, that actually looks very like a dog, then it is kind of on the decision boundary and that image cannot actually be uh, be robust. So there, that, that's a much difficult problem. But for some other 
uh, properties to verify. For example, Chu uh, mentioned the uh, monotonicity uh, property earlier. For example, if you want to verify if, if the function is monotone globally or within a very large range, for that kind of property, actually, it makes more sense uh, to, to specify a global property. But for the robustness verification problem, it's kind of very tricky because you, you cannot easily enumerate all the possible images. And also, there are two corner cases where uh, images are indeed on different boundaries. So in, this image cannot be robust anyways. So, uh, but that's a very good question. And uh, thank you for asking this question. Uh, so, any additional questions be, be, before I hand over to my colleague? Yeah, there's a, another question. So, Jing, Jing Wo, uh, are you going to ask a question? Maybe you are muted, I can't, can't hear you. Uh, are there any additional questions right now? Hey, me? Sorry. So, uh, was, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I was, not, I was yeah. struggling with this uh, interface. How to enable my yeah. mind. Anyway, cool, cool, so yeah. thanks for the uh, presentation. I have one question regarding this uh, a slide 37. 37. So, so uh, the... and actually the tra also 36. Let's start with 36. Okay. So my understanding mm -hmm. of your approach is basically uh, you divide the real activation function into two parts, right? Right. Because it's piecewise. Yes. Anyway. Right. And yes. then you are treating each neuron in the neural network as a piecewise function, basically two types, right? Right. right. And then yeah. you are you are basic because here we have two cases for each neuron. You are making division, like you are you are exploring this. You are navigating across all possible cases, right? Right. Yeah, you're right. The understanding is totally correct. Okay. So you start from a in, in slide thirty six, a uh, thirty seven. You start with negative three. That's I think it's just, just a random number you choose, right? Yeah, just a random number for and then, and then you go down here uh, by taking all these possibilities, right? Right. So how is the scalability of your approach? So uh, that's actually a very good question. So so essentially the problem is the NC complete problem. So the complexity is gonna be exponential. So yes. no, no matter no matter what our, our, what smart algorithm you are using here, the worst case uh, complexity is always exponential. So, so for example, if we have thousands neurons, and the, the theoretical complexity is going to be really, really high. Uh, but, but the good thing here is uh, we, we don't have to fully explore all the possible combinations. So as long as uh, all the leaf nodes becomes positive, we can finish verification. So that usually happens uh, before you actually split all the possible neurons. And uh, so in terms of scalability, so our current uh, tools can roughly scale to uh, maybe to, uh, at most, I believe, a million neurons, maybe uh, in that, in that uh, uh, roughly a million neurons. But these networks, uh, in these networks, usually we found that you don't have to split many, many neurons to, to prove the robustness. Especially if, if you train your network using a cell training, um, the network should actually be already robust. In that case, uh, we found that uh, maybe the typical case, you, you can split maybe 30 to 40-ish neurons uh, before you can prove the, the robustness. If you have to split more, actually, that's actually not really possible because, uh, as you mentioned, the exponential um, exploration is going to be quite costly. and uh, we, we, of course, we cannot actually solve every possible problem because this is an empty complete problem. We cannot solve every problem. Just in practically, uh, for example, if you train your network using other sort of training, we can usually uh, prove the robustness uh, by just splitting maybe 20 or 30 ish neurons. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. This is a very good question for understanding the algorithm. Okay, if there's no further questions, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, uh, hand over to my colleague, Kai Di, and uh, 
Here I'll be introducing uh, the, the practical tools you, 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 you want to use for neural network application. Because uh, if you don't understand all the algorithm I just uh, talked about, that's totally fine. If you just want to use neural network verification in your uh, project, for example, you can just uh, pay more attention to Heidi and Shichi's presentation. They will tell you how these tools actually work are in practice. And we also have collab demos to show you how, how that works. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? So, Heidi, you are, you are muted, so we can uh, hear you. OK. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear and you. And also, can you, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay, how about this terminal? Yes, I can see the terminal. Okay, great. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Juan. Thank you for Juan Cho's very nice introduction on the uh, theoretical side of the complete and incomplete verification. And in my part, I will uh, introduce a, a verification tool called Auto Lirpa. Okay. So this tool will help us to see if you are not very familiar with the like the bond propagation, it's still okay to help you like whether either training or even ver or verify uh, existing deep neural network model. And also, uh, my next friend, uh, the next spe speaker, Shi Qi, will uh, present a complete verifier tool called Alpha Beta Chrome, which is also uh, implemented based on the auto Okay, so. This is a, a very quick recap. So I will like compare the auto Liarpa auto library with the uh, PyTorch to see what's the difference here. And so if we have a uh, input data, which is a cat over here, and, and, and in your like PyTorch library, you are get a final output during after the forwarding of a neural network. So for example, here the cat will have a, 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 a have a like the confidence with the, the 3.4. This, so this is a score for each different class. And here we, we are uh, trying to deal with the three classification problem. Uh, so uh, if we have an input image, and also because in the uh, robustness verification, we also have another concept, which is the perturbation range of the data. So for example, the, the input can be bounded in like in any LP norm, can be L2 or L, L infinity norm with the epsilon, like the 0 0.1 or 0 0.3. And also not even on input data. So sometimes your, your parameter, your width also may have some uh, perturbation. So we can still, we can bond them all by, by, uh, by defining a perturbation range on either the input or the width together. And then our auto layer part will automatically give you the lower and upper bound for the, each different classes. So in this case, like for example, the, the cat will have a lower bound, which is 2.3, and also have an upper bound, which is a 4.5. That means whenever the, uh, so let me open my laser for a minute. Okay, that means uh, whatever the perturbation added on the input or added on the uh, parameters, the cat will all the, the, the confidence of the cat will always greater than two point three and less than the four point five, and also similar things happen in the in another two cases like the dog and the panda, and also I want to mention is that in this case, the in, the classification of the cat is guaranteed. Because the 2.3, which is the lower bound, is larger than the upper bound of the other two classes. That means the, the cat is always the, the top one label in your final output. So the cat in, the, in this perturbation set is, is safe. OK. And the benefits for using our auto Liarpa library, so uh, we'll have three uh, different uh, factors. So the first one is that our, our library is automatically bound derivation on existing PyTorch model. So users will have uh, no need to know any like pre-knowledge of the verification algorithm. And also they will do not need to have the manual derivation or implementation for the new model architectures. So here are some examples that our uh, library so far uh, supported. So the, the definitely the traditional convolutional neural network and also the complex ResNet, DenseNet. And also in language model, we, st we still support that, like LSTM and transformer. Okay. The, the second benefit is that uh, our library allow a, gen a general perturbation analysis on both data input or the network weights as they are, or that, as they are treated similar as the input of the graph. So for example, this is the actual neural network and data will be represented as a circle. 
And also, actually, width is another input of a computational graph. So in our library, we do not treat them differently. So the perturbation can be happen on both data and width. And I will also give you the score of which is a, uh, which contain the both lower bound and upper bound in this perturbation range of data and weights. And the last one is that our bound is all differentiable and uh, can be accelerated on GPUs. That means we can allow in a very efficient training for even large scale uh, certified defense method. Okay. So here, finally, uh, we will uh, first see like a very high level API of our uh, library, AutoLiarpa. So you can see this is uh, only a few lines of the code. And first, uh, you need to define your, uh, your model, PyTorch model. So it can be uh, any complex or irregular network. So like the Transnet, ResNet, Transformer, LSTM. So just to make it as, as your standard PyTorch model over here. We do not need to, to, need to do like any uh, specific modification. And then you just uh, call your model and load uh, some data. This is just uh, the data that you may be interested in to uh, test the, the, the certified, uh, sorry, the, uh, to calculate the certified, certified lower and upper bound. And then in the first step, you need to wrap your model. So this function is provided by our library, bounded model function. It will help you convert uh, like PyTorch, PyTorch defined model to a, a wrapped model, which, have, which has a function of the computer bound. So this is the first step. So, so, this, uh, so this function only have two arguments. It's necessary two arguments. The first one is your original model. And the second one is a, it, it's actually a fake input. So as long as this input have the, have the uh, same size with the, uh, your, your conventional input, it, it's, it's fun. And then we just need to define the perturbation and, and wrap with the input together. And then you can finally uh, compute your bond by this one line function. And I will go into details about these functions. Okay. So the first one is definitely the bonded model. This is the, the core part of our uh, AutoLiarpa library. So the, usually we know in the PyTorch, the neural networks are defined by the end of module. And, and, and it can uh, convert it to the bond module. So in, in the only one line code. And the, uh, the, the bond module builds a trace graph giving a new uh, n dot model, the, the traditional PyTorch model as an input tensor. And then it constructs the computational graph to compute bonds based on the trace graph. So that means once we, the, the model converted by our bond, uh, bonded module, so we, we know that each connection between the different operations. So we, whenever it, it, it can be like the convolutional layer or, or the dense layer, ReLU layer, whatever, but we, we know the we know the every uh, input node or the intermediate nodes. We know their input, we know their output, and also we can uh, link them together to build this computational, computational graph. Okay, and then the second important part is the, what we call the perturbation, uh, uh, perturbation range. So for example, uh, for the commonly used LP norm, so the P could be equals to zero, one, two, or L infinity. So you, you can just easily pass the norm that you, you, you are interested in to verify here to the, to the, to the norm argument. And then with the, the epsilon side, like 0 0.1, which is the, which is the inf L infinity bound, that means all the pixel cannot be changed larger than 0 0.1. And in some cases, uh, uh, people may have their customized uh, lower and upper bound. So they are not uh, like regularly, so not, uh, not every pixel have a, a specific same range. So we can also like support the customized, element-wise, the lower and upper bound for each different pixels. And also in some other cases, we can support. We can also try to support uh, different kind of perturbations, as long as the concretization function is provided. Uh, for example, the, the uh, if you have the two dash line, which is the linear bound, so as long as you can provide it how to extract the the, uh, the FL and FU based on this two dash line. Then this, this procedure called concretization. So we will also introduce this, uh, another uh, uh, perturbation uh, instead uh, beyond the like, LP norm. Okay. And then uh, continue on the, the perturbation, you need to like wrap the perturbation with your input together. So your imp because the, every perturbation is defined over input. So by, by calling this bounded tensor, you actually uh, try to uh, like, uh, merge the perturbation with the input together. So in that case, the, my input here will always uh, have a perturbation range, which defined by the PTB. Okay. 
And similarly, not even for the bounded tensor, we also uh, support the bounded parameter, which means you can also perturb on, uh, on, the, on the weights, on the model, model parameters. OK. And finally, after you have, have the all, uh, all, of, all of them in your hand, you can just call this one line code, the model.computeBound function. Uh, to compute the lower and the upper bound with respect to the input. Because uh, as we already know, uh, the my input function here already have the perturbation range PTB. And also we can also choose the method to compute the bound. For example, the cron, which is the very complex as the uh, one introduced before. But in, in our library, you just need to uh, select the function as a cron will automatically help you to calculate the bound. And uh, except the cron, we also like support the IBP which is a very uh, fast, but uh, a little bit loose than the cron. And also like cron IBP for word bound and also the alpha cron, which is more ex expensive, but the tightest one in our library. Okay. And then let's see a uh, code demo. Uh, so, if you, you, uh, so if you open our slide, you can also try to uh, like step into this uh, Google Colab demo. So it can, uh, uh, you can also run this, uh, run the code cell by cell, and to see what will will happen. And first, uh, uh, if you are the new to the PyTorch, then uh, you, you need to like first install. So our library so far uh, uh, support like the PyTorch uh, one eight two, so it is a uh, long time support LTS version. And then uh, try to install our Auto Lyapa library. This is very simple, just by uh, using this one line code. Okay. And then uh, we import some uh, basic function that we will use in this code demo. And then we define a, a, a ResNet. So this, this ResNet is actually a very standard. We just copy uh, from the, uh, we just copy from the, 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 the official uh, implementation of the ResNet. So there are no difference with the standard ResNet. Okay. And here uh, we, we first, uh, uh, see it so it, it, we, we need to like uh, download a pre-trained ResNet model and see whether the uh, uh, the, the prediction is, is, is normal like here. Uh, we, we are using the CFR10 data set and so we download uh, CFR10 and we are we calculate about this is a, just a random number you can uh, uh, if you if we can calculate any number of uh, any index of the of this, this data set and in this code demo we select the index with one two three. Okay, and we see here for this rest night, the ground truth is two. And also we see the, 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 the confidence, num the confidence of the ground truth data is also the largest one. So this, this model is correct. Okay, and before, before the here, so all of them are standard way to like, uh, to processing a model, like to see their uh, test accuracy or to see some uh, natural forward propagation. And here we are, we are actually uh, first, uh, first attempt stepping into the, our auto layer library. So the step one is, is wrap our model with this bounded module function. So as I introduced before, there is only two arguments uh, for this function. So the first one is your original model, which is the ResNet we, we defined above. And the second one is, is a glo global input. So for this argument, it's a, it's, it is just, just a, 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 a argument to help us Trace the model, so the input is actually uh, the 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 the, con the, con the the value of the input is not it's not necessary needed. So we just need the shape over here. So here we just uh, uh, pass passing a zero like function which the images which is the index one two three, okay, and then we set the model to the evaluation mode. So this is the because the, this demo code only contains some uh, like the uh, bond calculation. This is not uh, containing any like the training procedure. But if you are train, train, train a model, you need to set it to a train. So this is exactly the same with the uh, PyTorch code. Okay. And then the second step is to define the perturbation. And here we use the uh, uh, infinity perturbation on the input image. So the, the epsilon is set at the 0, 0 0.003. So it can be larger or smaller, uh, depending on uh, your requirement. And then the norm here, the sorry, norm, here we use is the L, L infinity norm. So we define the LP uh, perturbation here and wrap with the image together by using the bounded tensor function. Okay, so from now, the, this bounded image, uh, sorry, this bounded image variable 
uh, has both uh, information about its central point, which is the original input, and also have its perturbation radiance, which is defined in the PDB over here. And then let's check the uh, model prediction. So we can see the, the prediction of our bounding model is exactly the same with the prediction of the, uh, the original model, because our, our bounding model also uh, uh, inherit all the like the functions of the PyTorch model. So we actually only add some function on it. So you can still uh, uh, like do any other operations like, rather than the forwarding, the, the basic forwarding. Okay. And the third step is compute bound using the compute bound method. So this is the uh, quite straightforward. So for example, uh, you can see we, we have already have the rapid uh, bounding model. So we only call this function compute bound. And then, because in this case, we care about the bounded image and we can use the method of Chrome over here. And then we have got the uh, lower and upper bound. And here we just, uh, this is just a auxiliary function to print all of the bound for the, uh, the, 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 the 10 classes. So we can rerun it over here. So we can see the Chrome bound of the, uh, the, the 10 classes have the, like the range of the around maybe uh, negative 10 to the, to the positive, so this, this is the largest uh, upper bound, and also uh, this is the lowest input, uh, lower bound. And uh, it looks like the uh, bound of the our class two is still very large because this is the true label. So this is this model we see is a kind of kind of robust, not very bad by, by calculate using the Chrome. Okay, and then we can also only change this this line, uh, only change the method from Chrome to IBP. So we see. Uh, we still print the bound. We can see uh, the, the IBP bound is quite, is actually uh, extremely loose compared with the Chrome, Chrome bound we calculated before. Uh, so, but, uh, so this is uh, uh, actually uh, just a, a very uh, pre a preliminary uh, illustration about our computer bound function. And then we, we, people may curious about, uh, because we claim our library is totally uh, differentiable. Then after such bound propagation, uh, can we still get the input over the either maybe the width or the, the uh, or the input? So let's check over here. Uh, so first we just uh, uh, clean up the, the, the cache grab maybe, and then we calculate the bound again. And see, uh, uh, then we define a loss function over here, which is the, just the, uh, the sum of the lower bound. So you can, if you have a label, you can definitely uh, like, like involving like cross entropy, or mean square error with the lower bound is still okay. But here we, we just uh, naively sum all lower bound. And then we call the lost, lost dot background is exactly the same with the, the PyTorch training mode, training mode process. And then let's check uh, the, the gradient with re respect to the first convol convolutional layer of the width. So the model uh, dot modules, and the, so this line is just to try to extract the, the first convolutional layer space. And then we see the grand, the, the norm, the, uh, the, the, the output norm of the gradients of the first convolutional layer is like around, uh, around 100. So that means the, the, grad, the gradient is not known. That means we can do the, definitely do the gradient descent or gradient ascent, ascent depends on uh, your requirement uh, based on our auto layer pi library. Okay. So that's it. So this is a very uh, a simple, like the, uh, demo to show the our first our uh, our total procedure is the differentiable, and then we can very very easily uh, compute the bound using it either the IBP and the, the Chrome method. And al also, I like to say is that uh, we have another uh, uh, verification. Uh, simple, we, have, we have another verification demo called simple verification. Uh, so let's see. So if you can uh, go into our auto layer path uh, official library over here, you can go to the example and the vision part and see this is a simple verification uh, demo here. So this is a little bit uh, like the larger or a complex than the demo I, I previously showed, but the core idea is still same. So we, def you, you, we define our model over here and we, we wrap the model, uh, we wrap the uh, and load the uh, uh, pre-trained Pre weights, and then we uh, actually this time loading the amnesia data, and on, we only care about two of them. And then we like, like, like wrap, our, wrap our model over here, and then we define the perturbation. So here we are using, still using L infinity, but the epsilon is a little bit larger to the 0 0.3. And then 
uh, we will, uh, uh, in this code demo, we actually calculate bound within this one, two, three, four, five, within these five functions together. Uh, so we first we will first show the bound of IBP, and then we will show the bound of Chrome IBP, and then we will show the expensive Chrome method, and then we will show the most tightest one, Alpha Chrome. And we can see uh, you can you, you just uh, what you only need to do is like uh, tapping this method over here. This is the method, and you just uh, just tapping the method, which is the, the first part. If you, you are you interested in the Chrome optimized, you can just uh, uh, change the uh, this method to the Chrome op optimized. Then it will show you the the bound calculated by the Chrome optimized. Okay, and uh, another part is uh, advanced usage that you, we can extract the margin between the two uh, specific labels, which will not be uh, covered in this tutorial. Okay, uh, then let's see uh, what's the result. Okay, uh, so this is the bond calculated by, uh, by the IBP. We can see the range is roughly between the, the negative 100 to the uh, positive 100. And then by using the Chrome IBP, uh, the bond will improve a little bit, like over here. And finally, if we, we're using Chrome, uh, the bond will between like the negative 10 to the positive 10. And also, if you, you are you want to use in the alpha Chrome, which which using the gradient descent to choose the the best lower bound, the bound here will become uh, uh, more tighter, which is the, you can see, compare with the, the first line. This is the alpha chrome, and this is the chrome. Okay. All right. Uh, Linda, let's continue to the, our presentation. Okay. And then you, you already uh, have the basic knowledge to, uh, of the how to like, calculate the lower and upper bound by using our library. And then let's go deeper. Let's see how to really train a robust model based on our knowledge. So I think the only gap over here is, is that we need to like define a loss function to, to like by leverage such lower bound or upper bound to train a robust model. So here we, we back to our example again, we like feeding this cat into a neural network. And we know this cat will uh, have a different lower and upper, upper bounds with, with respect to different classes, the cat, dog, and the panda. So here, so one suggested loss can be defined as the lower bound of your true label, the margin between the lower bound of your true label, which is a 2.3 over here, within the upper bound of others, like 1.2 and negative 0.1. Because as long as the margin between the, this, the 2.3 with the, this two value larger than larger, then we know the cat will become more and more robust. So this is the, uh, a very typically used uh, uh, say the, the, the robust cross entropy fun loss function. Okay, so let's see the example of the simple training. So how to, uh, how, how, uh, how can we really do it in practical? So in a simple, simple training function, so here, uh, so everything is still uh, actually we're just using like the 200 lines code to train a robust model by using our our, our library and most of them are already well defined. You can treat, treat it as a template. So maybe you can only change a few lines to, uh, to your own model or your own customized requirement. So here first, so this is just a, so here we just first select data set. This is very normal. And then we like preparing data set as euro. Like we can, we can do either MNIST or safe our training. And then we wrap our model. So, so we still need the original model and the dummy input, which as long as the shape is correct. And here we like add more some arguments over here, but they are not like necessary. Uh, so you can uh, just ignore them. But by the way, because we can support in GPU, both GPU and CPU. So, so remember to select your uh, correct device over here. And then we also using an Epsilon schedule because to learn a robust model, uh, the Epsilon cannot be like at, at the very beginning, we directly uh, adding a 0 0.3 a very large epsilon on the input that will make your model diverge and, and never come to normal again. So usually we're using epsilon schedule. So this epsilon will, will, will grow from, from uh, smallest ones, from, from zero to the largest one. So, so and we, we also like already uh, defined the different uh, epsilon schedule over here. So you, you can just select the one that you, you, you most like. Okay, 
and then it start to training. So during the training function, so although it looks like a little bit uh, uh, difficult, but actually you do not need to uh, change so much things. So everything already help you define. And like the cross entropy loss is uh, actually uh, implemented by the specific matrix. And also we support the different like the IBP uh, cron or cron IBP method over here. Okay. And finally, so if you are interested in training your own, your own model, I think the only part you need to change uh, in this field is the model origin. So maybe uh, we, 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 because we uh, we define some uh, uh, some model in our in our in our library, but if you want to like train your own model, you just need to replace the mo model ori ori model original here, and then you can you, you will be all set. And if you are, you are interested in like the different epsilon, uh, you can change it over here, and different alpinome is also supported over here. Okay. And then uh, I will also show show example of a, a, a training a like robust LSTM and also a transformer, which is a language model. So let's see, uh, let's, let's first see the code a little bit. Okay, oh, and sorry, I forgot to mention, if you want to run the, uh, run the ex 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 examples, especially related to a language model, you also need to uh, require the, all the uh, uh, libraries uh, in the requirement.txt. Okay, and let's see the language model. So in the language model, actually since are, are all different between the, your, uh, your vision training, you still need to prepare your data side and also you need to like wrap your, wrap your model uh, like over here. The only different thing is over here. So in the language model, because we are doing the, uh, called the synonym replacement, uh, that means we, we, we try to replace some words in a sentence but still keep the, the uh, still uh, keep the similar meaning. So the so the alpinome is not uh, very good here. So there is no existing the definition of alpinome. So here we use the number of budget, which means the number of the words that you can replace in a whole sentence. Okay. So the perturbation will not be the perturbation alpinome. So this time we will help you define a perturbation called synonym. So that that's all. Once you replace this perturbation, so the other things are are are, are always uh, similar to the uh, to the previously uh, CFR or simple training uh, demonstration. Okay, so let's let's see what's the what's the result. Uh, and also, if you do not know the command line, like how to run a, a run a, a how to train a language model or how to train a vision model, I refer you to like go over here. So we have a very good documents. Like at the that's the uh, this link document homepage. Okay, as you can see, uh, we go to the example part, and this is the simple verification example, and also the simple training, and then uh, we go to like the uh, image knife. If you you, you are you are you are interested in like how to train an image a tiny image knife, you can also follow this uh, construction. It's actually just a few few lines, and here uh, we go to the language model. So if you want to train a language model, first you need to download some data set because I, I already did it before. So I will not uh, do it again. So download and extract it. Okay, <laughs> wait for a second because we are, uh, we're printing the log for each uh, 100 steps. So uh, sometimes it's, it's take longer. But, but we, we also have an argument that can uh, print the, the, uh, the log more frequently. Okay. Mm, maybe you can just uh, uh, let it run over here. So I will uh, step next step, uh, next slide. Okay. Oh, so the in next examples, I will try to show a perturbation happening on the weight. So as we said before, our library uh, treats no difference between the perturbation happening on the, on the input data and also the model parameter. So we also provide a, a, a template to how to like train, training on the weights. So if you are really, uh, if you really see the, example of the weight perturbation training. You will see that all of them are exactly actually same with the 
the simple training or the CFR, CFR 10 training. The only different thing is here, because the, the, this time, the perturbation is happening on your wrist. So you see we are calling a model called resistance, resistance, this name, MLP Australia weight perturb. Then you, you can see, if you only see this model, the model is defined in this, in, in this field. So this is the MLP Australia weight perturb. So you can you need to like pre-define the perturbation that happened on your on your weight. You see over here. So this is the three layers MLP, and we, we perturb all of the three layers width and per perturb the, all of the three layers biases. So that's all. Uh, so we need to define the perturbation inner the, 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 the model function because we, the, the perturbation is happening on the weight. So we cannot stand alone like perturb on, on the input. So deal with everything outside the model definition. So this is the only difference between the, your training a uh, like a way too robust model rather than a, a, a robust model against the input. Okay. Well, finally, we also see the first step of the, the accuracy of the LSTM. So for LSTM, we can uh, correctly track the, the natural accuracy and also the robust accuracy. So usually at the beginning, the robust accuracy is very low. This is very normal. And also the, the, the but clean accuracy is definitely, definitely higher than robust accuracy. Uh, then I will also try to run the, oh, sorry, run the weight perturbation code. And also, as we said before, if you do not know the, the, the really command line to, uh, to run the weight training, you can also refer to the documentation pages over here. And we just wait. Okay, the weight perturbation. So the, the, this one, just this one. And copy it over here. So we see for the weight perturbation training, we have the we have the uh, two arguments. The first one is the LP norm. So here we're we're not using the L infinity norm. We're using the L two norm to bond the 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 the, the, the perturbation happen on the weights. And also for the bonding method, we are using the quantity P. So that's the meaning uh, of the uh, of these two arguments. Okay. And finally, uh, we have the so for the weight perturbation training, we have a, a ten apple warm up. Which means the in the first ten epochs we are all doing the standard training, and we can got a, got a model with the standard accuracy. So this is the error rate. So the standard accuracy is around ninety five percent. Okay, and after we we gradually increase the epsilon, we see uh, from a very small value to larger than larger. We can see the robust across the the, the, the verified error also increase a little bit. So this, this is also normal because the uh, we try to gradually increase the epsilon. That means at the beginning, actually, the, the, there is the only very small epsilon can be added on your weights. And, and finally, you will uh, add the weights with a very, very large, large value, which is 0 0.1, if, I, if I'm correct. But it, it will take a long time. So the whole procedure will uh, maybe run 100 epoch or 200 epoch, take some maybe one or two hours to train a way too robust model. But finally, you will see the verified error will converge to like around 20%. And your, your robust error will be at around 90%. So this is the weight perturbation training. Okay. Uh, so let's go let's back over here. Okay, so uh, uh, also there are another examples provided in our, in our, in our library. So rather than like uh, already introduced like the LSTM transformer, we also support the tiny image net on the multi-GPU and also the different uh, setting of different model for the ME7 CFR training. And beyond that, uh, our, because our model also support different models, so we also released all robust trained model uh, on this link you can check over here. So they have different, they, they contain different model structures in the different data sets and in the different tasks. Okay. And this is the, to the best of our knowledge, it, these are some uh, papers that directly used our auto LARP library or uh, implement based on our auto LARP library. Okay, so uh, so is there any question so far? Uh, so if not, I will like turn over to our next speaker, Shishi. So and he will uh, present the alpha beta cron, which is the complete verification. Now let me check. Okay, uh, we we have one uh, in. Ping Ying. Hey, hey, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, 
So uh, I have a question about the. I see Dean, yeah. are, you are in the uh, stand here for Mac for Mac area. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, can if you, you hear have me? questions, so feel free to ask here. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Hi, Dean. Hey. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, Heidi, can you hear me? Oh, uh, sorry. I actually I, I can't hear you. Shixian uh, Huang, can you hear the Ding Ying? Uh, I think they can hear me, but uh, I don't know why. Heidi, can you hear? Oh. Oh, sorry. I I I can't hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, so can I? So can I ask the question and someone I ask? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear him. So you can just ask a question. I can answer. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay. looks like something something wrong in in my side. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, so first of all, I thank you for the great talk. So, uh, I I have a question. Uh, regarding the uh training phase. So. Um, the training phase looks like a, 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 a little bit similar. Oh, sorry, my bad. I, I don't know why the, 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 the sound is not output from my art. Now I can hear you. Go uh, okay. ahead, Dean. Okay, okay. So the training phase is uh, a, a little bit similar to the uh, 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 classic uh, adversarial training. So I'm wondering what is the exactly. difference between, the, uh, between your uh, 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 the Crown uh, method and the, the classic uh, adversarial training. This is the first question. And the second question is that there's a trade-off. Uh, so in the in the uh, classic uh, adversarial training, there's uh, always a trade-off between the robustness and the, the uh, model accuracy, right? So uh, mm -hmm. do you, uh, do you have the similar uh, problem in your uh, in your training? The okay, thank you. Uh, robustness. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, so first, uh, uh, I introduce it over here. You can see this slide. So this is the, uh, the only difference between the traditional minimax uh, adversarial training to the certified adversarial training, I think is the loss function uh, definition. And here uh, I introduce uh, how to define a, a certified loss, which enlarging the, the margin between the lower bound of your true, true class between the upper bound of other classes. So that's the uh, only different part with the adversarial training. So in adversarial training, you, you first need to generate an uh, adversarial example in your uh, inner maximum function. But in certified training, you do not need to generate adversarial example. You just need to calculate this lower bound. And the margin between the lower and upper bound can be a, a kind of indicates the worst cases in, in, in this example. So this is still a kind of max function, but actually uh, representing a different way. So this is the difference between the uh, adversarial training and the certified training. And also because we are finding a provable lower bound. So our, our maximum function is more actually more harder. Uh, we, 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 I, I can't say it's, it's, it's more better, but it's definitely more harder than the, 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 the conventional minimax out of cell training. So this is for your uh, first question. And for your second question, so that's definitely for true. So <laughs> because there's no free lunch, so the trade-off between the, the certified robust accuracy uh, uh, so far actually very hurt the, the niche accuracy, to be honest. This is uh, also the similar phenomenon observed in the idle cell training. And not in the certified accuracy, it's even worse. So if you want to achieve better certified accuracy, then the uh, the clean accuracy will be even worse than the adult cell training method. Okay. So, okay. Th so that, that's my so it, is it clear to you or you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if if there is no other question, so I will turn over to the next presentation. Okay. I'll stop share. So hi, Shichi. Hi, Heidi. Uh, can you see on, uh, Can you see my screen? Yes, yes I can. Uh, the is the correct one. Your screen. Uh, let me check. Uh, okay. It's good. Okay, cool. You can hear me as well, right? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you very much for Heidi's awesome talk. And um, yeah, this is the last session for our tutorial. And in this session, I'm going to talk about the practical usage of our complete verifier, Alphabet Cron. 
uh, essentially it is a scalable and efficient neural network verifier. Uh, the code is available at abcron.org. Uh, notably, it is the winner of International Verification of Neural Network uh, Competition in 2021. And uh, all the slides and uh, code tutorial demos are available at our official uh, website. In the following talk, I'm going to quickly give you an overview of Alpha Beta Chrome, quickly mentioning its uh, benefits for complete verification compared to the other existing tools. And lastly, I will talk about the basic usage with several examples so that you can easily use Alpha Beta Chrome and customize it to, uh, for your own model and data. All right. Okay, uh, so in the last session, Katie mentioned Chrome and Alpha Chrome with auto uh, which is a very strong tool for incomplete verification. Uh, but both of them are incomplete verifiers, which means that they are very efficient, but cannot improve the verification with, with more verification time. Therefore, they have limited verification instances compared to complete verifiers. Um, um, let's recall the definition of complete uh, verification. It means that uh, we can guarantee to prove any properties given sufficient time. And uh, as Juan and Cho mentioned, like, um, branch and bound is the common method to uh, improve the verification perform performance intuitively until the property is verified um, as, a uh, as a complete verification. Um, compared to incomplete verifier, our complete verifier, Alpha Quan, can verify more instances, but at the cost of relatively more time. So here in the table, um, we show results on two adversely trained MNIST and the CIPA-10 models. And uh, you can see that Chrome only needs around 0.1 and 0.6 seconds to have some verified accuracy, while Alpha Beta Chrome, uh, which is a complete verifier, requires uh, several seconds, but can verify much more instances compared to Chrome. All right, uh, so here's a very quick uh, recap or overview of how we do complete verification using branch and bound. For each step, we are select one real neuron and uh, into two subdomains. One is larger than zero and one is uh, less than zero. And then we will use beta cron to, um, to bound each uh, split subdomain as a bounding step. Uh, and then we can select real neuron splits as a branching and use beta cron to bound recursively until we form this uh, branch and bound uh, searching tree on the right side, uh, as introduced by Juan, to achieve good verification performance in an efficient manner, we aim to do verification with highly uh, parallel branching and efficient bounding on GPUs. Um, our other Bayer Quant algorithm has several uh, benefits compared to the other existing measures. Uh, is there any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so first, our measure relies on efficient bound propagation by our on GPUs, which is much faster than traditional ones using generic linear solvers on CPUs. And second, uh, our measure is an optimizable procedure such that we can achieve much tighter bounds for each subdomain compared to the others. Um, lastly, we can massively parallel the branching steps on GPUs which allows us to quickly explore a large number of subdomains in one single beta cron population. Okay, these advantages allow us to have very house, as you can see. Uh, other beta cron can verify the most number of instances on all, all, uh, all benchmarks. Uh, you can find the detailed results uh, uh, for the competition in the competition report available at this link. All right. Um, therefore, the state the art performance is the strongest benefit of using our Alpha Beta Chrome for verification. Also, our implementation has very good integration with PyTorch, so that um, we are able to directly load most of the PyTorch or Onyx models to directly do the verification. Also, our APIs are very friendly. You can just simply customize the task through a single config file, as you will see uh, very soon. Additionally, we provide many examples for using Alpha Beta Chrome, including customization examples. Okay. To run Alpha Beta Chrome for your own model and task, you just need to define your own special model and special property. Then you just run with the 
come on in Kamal Lang. And um, it's just that simple. Now let's get into the details of how to use Arma Biacron for complete verification. Commonly, the command has only a main file, uh, which is the robustness verifier.py, and uh, another config file with config argument. Uh, here is a config file example for verifying and virtually clean uh, MNIST model, MNIST DNA DB. And we will get to see what each task uh, in the config file means in the following slide. Okay. So all the parameters are available uh, at our documentation. You can find most of the parameter configurations that you might need here. Let's take a quick look at the documentation of overall parameter structure. Okay, uh, so here's the documentation. You can see that uh, at the highest level, we have several options like the general with device, uh, computer mode, uh, mood, and uh, and then the model like with the path name and data structure, uh, data set with the data, and the specification for the perturbation, uh, perturbation uh, range and the, the property you want to verify, and uh, the solver with alpha cron, beta cron, MIT, and uh, some branch and bound options with type of parameters. And uh, yeah, that's uh, basically all kinds of the parameters that one might need to run the verification with alpha, beta, cron. And you can tune any kind of hyperparameters in both terminal or config file. Okay, so one nice, uh, one nice thing for our API is that one can customize arguments directly in command line. The chains are equivalent to the ones in the config file. For instance, here, that 0 and the um, n 100 means to verify MNIST data set from index 0 to 100. Therefore, with this command, we can just run the first 100 MNIST images for verification. Uh, it allows us to quickly complete the experiments in command line, while config files still let us have structured arguments and a much easier way to reproduce the results uh, we got. Okay. So here are some important arguments I want to introduce. The first set of arguments is model. Here's an example of MNIST four-layer convolutional model we are used for MNIST DNA DB. Uh, most of model definitions can be found in uh, model uh, depth.py. And uh, one can easily configure the data set through the set of the argument data set, uh, including the name of the data set, uh, start and like for instance start zero and one means to, to verify the first image and uh, also the normalization of the data equivalent standard deviation and the mean. Okay, and uh, one can also customize the robustness property specification configuration here in this specification uh, tag, uh, including the epsilon for the population range and the type of the LP norm that you want to verify. So L18 norm is uh, the default, but you can also change it to L2 or L1. I know that the, the, the type uh, for this norm is the four point number. And um, we also later with another box data example for element wise uh, bound verification if you set the, the type here uh, to bound instead of the norm. So if the norm as the default is for LP norm, but for bound is the element wise bound for that allows the user to customize any kind of the data range that they want to verify with the special uh, properties and the data set. Okay. And uh, another important thing is the batch size uh, for running beta cron. It is under server uh, beta cron. And uh, um, it means that the maximal batch size allowed for running beta cron. Larger batch size, of course, will lead to better performance. However, you have to be very careful here that too large batch size will cause out of GPU memory error. Therefore, we recommend to adjust it to uh, fit the maximal GPU memory available. Okay. Um, and uh, the total timeout threshold for each verification instance can be configured under BAB timeout. All right. So these are all important arguments that you might need to run after the Chrome and after you have configured everything uh, for your own task, you can run um, the alpha beta cron with this command line. And uh, here's uh, 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 the eventual output of alpha beta cron in terminal, summarizing the overall results returned. 
For instance, here we run verification for the first 100 amnesty images on amnesty and AGG. Uh, in total, we we'll have 100 images. So in the first line, uh, it shows that there are 98 images are classified correctly without amputation, while the rest two are incorrect in the second line, which is not needed to verify uh, with the index 33 and the 73. Okay. And uh, uh, in the yellow uh, box line, uh, it shows that there are 26 images are verified unsafe under a test. We have a combination of the saved art uh, test to prove the property to be unsafe. And uh, then the, um, the blue box uh, shows that there are like uh, 67 images that can be verified safe eventually by alpha bar crown total. And, um, uh, in the uh, purple line, uh, we summarize the, the failure cases. There are total five cases or five images that cannot either be verified safe or unsafe and still need to other, need other like, uh, tests or like, uh, stronger tools to verify in the future. But now the five is a very small number out of 100 and we can achieve very good performance on this example. Okay. The average verification time is 20 seconds. Uh, 23 seconds at the last line. All right, uh, so here's the full example for running Amnesty and AGG on CoLab. Uh, since the installation takes several minutes to save time, I will not run the code in real time, but I have run it before so that you can see the print out and understand what happened while you run Alphabet Chrome. If you want to run the example, um, you can just make a copy and then run from the start. Okay, um, all right. So here is a pointer to the example. At the beginning, I wrote some instructions and descriptions for Alphabet Chrome. Then the first section includes the installation and import from for some uh, important libraries. Here is I install the Alphabet Chrome through Miniconda. So I, I download Miniconda and uh, uh, install it with the collab. And uh, then you can just uh, clone the Alphabet Chrome repo. And uh, uh, we provide the environment.yml, and you can just create a conda environment with that environment directly to install all of the required uh, dependencies to run on Alphabet Chrome. Then after installation, you can just uh, cd to the, the, the main file and then start to run. So here's the example for the amnesty and AGG that we showed before. Uh, at the beginning, you need to define your own configure file to run these experiments. Um, this is just a copy of the config file we showed before in the slide. Uh, so essentially, uh, you have the model name uh, to predefined in Intel.py and uh, the pre-trained model path uh, to load the weight. And then the data set, which is the MNIST, a standard deviation line. There's no normalization, you just go one. And the uh, specification is the L18 norm with epsilon 0.3 and uh, um, some uh, like batch size for that crossover and timeout 180 seconds. Uh, in total, if um, the run is out of 180 seconds, then you will just terminate and report as the failure cases. Um, right, so here is an example of running some images with this configuration. So, yeah, I just uh, 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 like print out the, the run for the 21st, second, uh, 21st uh, images um, to show what kind of print out while you run Alphabet Chrome. Uh, so here at the beginning, um, Alphabet Chrome will print out the basic configuration for this run, uh, including all of the hyperparameters and the, 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 the parameters I mentioned before, and then the, the details of the models. And then you will download the MNIST dataset if you have not downloaded it. And then you will start to run the 22nd, uh, 21st image, MNIST image with the first uh, verification issues. And uh, then uh, you will first uh, report the clean accuracy. And uh, under PG attack, uh, we'll count out the, uh, the, 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 the gap or like the uh, the position range that you can have with PDG uh, attack margin that you can have with PDG attack, then uh, like if PDG attack cannot success, then you will uh, 
uh, report fail with attacks, then you will continue with the, the, the verification process. Um, so first, you will run like uh, here. Um, uh, this is the initial Chrome bound we got. And then we will run other Chrome. You will see that with this other Chrome, which is to optimize the, the lower bound slope as introduced by ID, and we can have um, uh, much tighter uh, bounds compared to the initial Chrome bound. So here, like uh, each number uh, uh, indicates the, the, the target label, for instance, the label 0, label 1, the label 2, uh, if uh, compared to the ground truth label, the ground truth label is fixed. So um, if uh, any target label uh, larger than 0, it means that this label, the output will never be small, uh, be larger than the target label and uh, verified to be uh, safe. Um, while for negative part, it means um, we can still now verify this label. We need to do the further uh, branch and bound uh, complete verification process to further verify against this label. So um, after we run Alpha Chrome, we will uh, assault the, a label according to the Alpha Chrome bound um, uh, for each label. Uh, uh, in the order of the word case bound first. So first, uh, like the label five has the word, which is the minus 2.3 um, alpha chrome bound. Then we are first do branch of bound against the uh, label five. And um, for label five, we are seeing that there are total uh, 1,471 unstable ring neurons. Uh, it means that the worst case, we need to split that much, uh, that many ring neurons uh, to to prove the properties, but of course, um, usually in practice, it's not that much uh, many neurons that we need to be split. And um, so here, like at the first step, we select uh, one ReLU neuron. It means that the, the, the second ReLU neuron, uh, second ReLU layer, the 63rd index of the ReLU neuron in that layer, we use that, that ReLU neuron to, to split. Uh, this node like is selected by uh, uh, optimized uh, uh, branching strategy heuristic. Um, if you are interested, you can check our paper to see how we select uh, this neuron. So essentially, we select this neuron so that we can maximize the, the benefits uh, by splitting this really neuron first. Okay, so with that split, we are end up with two, uh, like, uh, two, two subdomains, and we can propagate uh, with the back bound together, and we get the bound, lower bound, upper bound for the subdomain, first subdomain, and the, the, the lower and upper for the second. And uh, we are report the worst case for now is uh, after split is uh, minus 1.965. Uh, if you compare before, um, with initial alpha chrome, it's uh, minus 2.38. We can obviously see the improvement with that, by, with that uh, split that really neuron. And then, because we split one real neuron, we end up with two subdomains, and for each subdomain, we have to select uh, one real neuron for each of them. And uh, so, for instance, at the second step, we select uh, the first real layer, 275 for neural index to split for the first subdomain, and uh, 278 uh, with that real to the uh, for the second subdomain. And after that split, we are up with the four subdomains. Um, and we collect uh, the worst case for now is minus five compared to minus one point nine six. It's uh, improved a lot. And uh, you can do continue to the uh, like the other the will continue to continue to the the branch and bound uh, this way again and again until um, this label the worst case uh, 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 current uh, LB uh, the, the worst case lower bound for that label five uh, becomes larger than zero. Uh, so eventually, uh, after selecting several uh, real neurons that split and refine, we, we get a bound that's larger than zero, which means that, okay, this uh, target label 5 is already verified, which means it will never uh, be the output, no matter how you change within the, um, uh, the point 0.3 epsilon L infinite norm bound range. And then after uh, verify the, the, the label ta target label 5, you can uh, start uh, for the second target label, which is 8. Uh, you do the same process again and again and you verify this label as well with the branch and bound uh, here. And then start the label two. Okay, and the same thing happens um, at the end. Um, you will see that uh, we verify all of the 
uh, label uh, by um, uh, that is not correctly verified by uh, initial alpha cron. And for the rest, like 9107, it's already verified by alpha, uh, alpha cron. So there's no need to do the further branch and bound to do the verification. So after we verify all of the uh, labels, uh, now we verify, okay, this image 21st um, is successful uh, with the branch and bound. This is the eventual results reported by alpha beta cron. Um, so um, we have uh, seen before, like this, this is the overview of this uh, running task on uh, income online. And um, there are total one example that is already verified and uh, the verification success uh, total one and with index 21st and uh, uh, verified accuracy 100% because it's just one sample. And the mean time is 13.7 seconds, uh, which is not so bad. Um, Okay, and uh, that's all of the printout that you will see by running this command. And uh, we have provided many, many more examples um, in the configura uh, configuration uh, folders. And you can click here and you see all of the examples we provided and you, um, you will get to run all these examples simply by uh, changing the uh, config file. All right, um, that's all for this example. Let's see now. We, let's see how we can use Alpha Beta Cron for predefined uh, uh, for for to customize for your own model and beta. So as I introduced before, it will be extremely easy. First, you just need to customize your own model in a Python file. So here, here we provide a sample uh, Python file custom uh, customized uh, model data.py and uh, um um. You can just define any model architecture with PyTorch. For instance, here is a simple convolution model for CIPA 10. Um, and also, we provide a very simple uh, two ALU uh, toy model. It just has two inputs, two ALU, and two outputs. And you can just even predefine the ways in here without loading any uh, uh, PyTorch model later. And here, like this example, is just a ReLU x plus 2y minus the loop to x plus y plus 2 as the eventual output of this uh, model. Um, and um, you can even define any kind of the models that you want uh, this way, uh, just to make sure that you return the, the correct uh, version of the model in PyTorch. And that's all you need to run your own model for Alpha Beta Chrome. Uh, in the next step, you just need to define your own data set and the perturbation configuration in any way you want. Just to keep in mind that you need to return uh, the data labels, uh, X labels, and data max, data mean, which is the max and mean values of the data. And also the epsilon is the epsilon range for either LEV or L2 or L1. Uh, but remember, it's normalized. Uh, with normalized, it will cause some problems uh, with the results. Know that we have already provided the official uh, CIPA 10 data in Pi, but you can customize the data any way you want following the customization here. So this is a very simple uh, CIPA 10 uh, loader with the epsilon provided, and you can customize anything any way you want on this code, or like change the data to SDHN or like other data can in that. And um, um, okay, and. Uh, uh, one can even define the data standard property element-wise, as uh, mentioned before. So for instance, uh, here, uh, we define one box data with two inputs, x and y. Uh, so it's just the x from minus 1.5 to 1, and y is from minus 1 to 1.5. And um, uh, it's just defined uh, within the range of data max and the mean. Um, you can just define any kind of the range you want, any kind of the batch size you want to verify. And uh, since it's element-wise uh, uh, perturbation range definition, so there will be no epsilon because we can use element-wise bounds. And uh, yeah, you can define arbitrary data with the one-tier perturbation range this way. Uh, you will see how later we uh, use this kind of definition in our uh, verification. Okay, so here, uh, this is a, a config file for our customized CIPA 10 uh, data and model. Um, uh, the, the sample is available at uh, uh, this part. So essentially, you just need to uh, find 
uh, the, the path of your predefined Python file we mentioned before and the, the predefined single configuration model with some input that you want to feed in. You can define any kind of input. Uh, that's very flexible. And also for data, um, we have predefined a simple GIFA 10 data loader for and uh, preservation. And you can just feed that in the data um, argument. And that's it. And you can just uh, run the, the, uh, the, the customized GIFA 10 example. Uh, and we provide this example in uh, Colab tutorial. So here is the tutorial for customization for official C part 10 CR standard self defined models. As we mentioned before, we define the, the convolutional models here, and uh, we define the C part 10 data loader uh, here. And uh, um, then uh, you define your own customized uh, convolutional file for. Uh, by feeding the convolutional model and the CIFAR 10 data loader. And uh, then you just need to uh, 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 run with that uh, predefined configure file. And uh, um, the printout is very similar to what we had before for NSC and ABV. So basically, you first print out all of the configuration and the predefined models for CIFAR 10. And then uh, it's the uh, the the clean uh, prediction PDD attack ma attack margin. Uh, it fails, then we continue to the verification with the initial alpha cron with the alpha cron, um, and then for unverified labels, for instance, there will be only one label, which is the H label that is not uh, uh, successfully verified by alpha cron. So we do the branch and bound on that uh, label. And though in total, there will be like 523 uh, unstable neurons. So we continue to the, do the root neural state and the beta cron branch and bound procedure until at the end, after three seconds, um, the, the target label is all verified with all these states. Okay, and uh, then we successfully verify, okay, uh, there's one sample and um, success with index three and uh, in total eight seconds, point seven seconds um, yeah and uh, that's it uh, for running your customized like C10 or other official data set okay, uh, so we also provide another example to customize your own uh, data with elements wise range so as we showed before like we define a simple box data <coughs> with element wise range for the input x and y and uh, we have the two deploy model we can also do that verification very easily, uh, but remember that you need to change the type to bound instead of the, uh, um, uh, the norm as the default. And uh, yeah, and uh, that's it. Um, let's get to the collab example. So all of the examples are in the same file. Uh, so I just the link points to the different uh, cell. Okay, uh, now we get to the customization for arbitrary data verification. And um, first, you write your own uh, two real toy model and the simple box data. Uh, it's just uh, the range we mentioned before, and there's no epsilon with the data max and data main uh, with the elements of wise range that you want to verify. And also, you feed that uh, two real toy model and the simple box data to uh, to the config file, and you can just start run uh, with that config file. Uh, so the printout is similar. Uh, first configuration, the model is just the two layers, two values, two output, and uh, <coughs> there'll be at the beginning total uh, two unstable values. So at the first state, we select the first value uh, in the first layer, and uh, then we'll select, uh, we select the second value and split. So you'll see at the beginning, the the initial alpha cron is minus 0.56, uh, 56. And uh, with the first split, it, it actually did not improve a lot. It just improved a little bit. Uh, but after the second split, we can then verify the, pro uh, the this problem with the box data element wise, the customized range um, with your own predefined model uh, with in just 1.6 seconds. All right, um, that's it. 
for all of the examples and uh, yeah, all the contributors to Alpha Black Chrome. Thanks uh, for a great effort to um, in building this uh, great tool. Okay, and uh, thank you very much for attending this tutorial. Hope this tutorial gives us uh, gives you a very decent background to neural network verification and gets you familiar to our Alpha Black Chrome uh, and Auto New Path for verification. The code is available at abcon.org. And uh, please start our GitHub repo if you find it very useful. And uh, if you have any questions regarding our tools or related to neural network application, just feel free to contact us. Okay, um, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions regarding the tools usage or any other questions.